so hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Muir. I'm an associate actually now in the uh, carbon circularity team, which is great. Um, and today I'm just going to give you a brief, a few brief insights into basically what's driving the construction industry's transformation to net zero across the world. Um, my goal with this presentation really is to try and broaden your perspective beyond just the UK and beyond carbon specifically, and sort of see how it all fits into the, the bigger global picture of, of sustainability more widely. So let's get stuck in. So first of all, I want to talk about net zero in context. So we're going to start by trying to put net zero in the wider context of the sustainability picture. Um, I think we can reframe this in terms of the, the three pillars model of uh, sustainability. So you've probably come across this before. Um, but for something to be truly sustainable, we want it to consider not just the environmental impacts, but also the economic and social benefits of uh, construction. Um, so really, our goal is to, uh, with construction, we're creating economic growth, so a positive for, from the economic point of view. But actually, it's, it's a sad fact that the majority of construction at the moment does damage the environment. Um, so we need to find a way of minimizing that damage. Um, but buildings are very important. We can't just stop constructing because buildings serve people's needs and society's needs. Um, so really, like we want to try and optimize this, I suppose. Uh, and if you're an engineer, you like an optimization problem. You want to try and minimize the environmental damage whilst maximizing the economic and social benefits of construction. You can kind of reframe this as well. So if you think about it instead as a kind of social foundation and then an ecological ceiling, um, the environmental and social bits, then it starts to look a lot more like the donut economics model, which you've probably come across before. Um, yeah, so as Smith mentioned earlier, it's, it's key to look at all the facets of this to make sure we, we get it right across the board. Um, net zero only really addresses this bit, the climate change challenges and the ecological ceiling that we're exceeding at the moment um, when it comes to uh, global warming. Um, but it is also good to see as well from Emily's presentation that the UK public sector projects do actually also cover a wide variety of these different themes. But that's how kind of net zero sort of fits into the wider sustainability picture, or at least one way of looking at it. If we drill down a bit further, when we talk about net zero in the built environment, we're actually talking about two different things here. So we're talking about the embodied carbon and the operational carbon. And uh, I've got some definitions on screen here. I'm not going to go through them, uh, which Letty published recently. And I think I'm making the way into the uh, latest version of the RICS professional statement. Um, but really, the, uh, if you're not aware already, then the embodied carbon is basically all of the emissions associated with material production and fabrication, manufacturing and site activities. Um, whereas the operational carbon is really what happens over the next 60 years or so once you're actually operating the building in practice. So it's the fuel and energy use construction, that sort of thing. Um, for this presentation, we're going to focus in uh, even more narrowly on the embodied net zero carbon bit and the policies and legislation around that. And then finally, there's an, another one that you could look through this, actually. So uh, in terms of embodied carbon in construction, you've got the supply side decarbonization and then the demand side decarbonization. So supply side in this context, I'm kind of calling that the, uh, basically the emissions from manufacturing and producing materials. Um, it's sort of the uh, decarbonization of industry. Um, and I think it's going to be talked about a lot more later. Um, whereas demand side, I'm sort of framing that as like the, the impact that we have, I suppose, as clients, as designers and specifiers, um, people are writing policy and influencing things. So we're, we're basically changing the demand for those materials whilst those materials are also on their own decarbonization pathway. Um, so again, we're going to focus in on, on the demand side bit today. Um, and actually, you do need both bits of the picture. So uh, like I say, uh, I think Natasha's talking a bit about the supply side decarbonization next and the innovation stream. Um, but really, uh, that's only half the picture. And this is some of the work that Ramble have done um, looking at how to map science-based targets onto uh, decarbonization generally. And really, a, a good portion of it is coming from avoiding, reducing, and shifting uh, emissions themselves. So that's how Zero fits in. Now let's talk about what's actually driving it in construction today. Um, our clients are seeing a lot of different pressures here. So there's there's the top-down pressures to reach net zero. So we've got the national climate commitments. We've got various bits of regulation and legislation coming in. Um, investors are also looking to decarbonize their portfolio. So there's pressures from there about uh, different requirements for new construction. And then there's also bottom-up pressures as well. So there's the public perception of uh, your business or your organization or your country. Um, there's the tenant occupier briefs. Tenants are increasingly requiring or owners are increasingly requiring uh, more sustainable um, and lower carbon buildings. And then climate activism is really kind of pushing this through as well from a kind of grassroots perspective. Um, and our clients really sit in the middle of all of this. So uh, they're really feeling the squeeze um, and to continue with the cheesy engineering allergies, they really need some support from us to relieve the pressure. Uh, so that's our job to kind of jump in and help them out. Um, but really our, our responsibility is to kind of understand their needs, see the bigger picture and then empower them to try and make the right informed decisions at the right time and make it as easy as possible for them. Okay, now we're going to dive into embodied carbon legislation around the world. 
So looking at those national climate commitments, we can see that the UK, USA, China, India, Australia, and Japan, the largest economies um, of all, or some of the largest economies have all made short-term commitments to reduce their carbon emissions by 2030. And then also long-term commitments to decarbonize completely, um, some by 2050, others 2060, 2070, but certainly in the next, uh, the next few decades. Um, as part of that, Often these different drivers uh, for investment requirements, regulation, legislation, tenant occupier briefs, and public perception, they also sort of point us towards certification and verification. So how do we prove that our buildings are actually green? How do we prove that they are um, on a good net zero pathway? Um, there's quite a variety of different voluntary schemes that are used internationally. They're not um, often, or often they are part of um, a project brief. Um, but actually some of the work we've done recently looking at this, actually we find that um, in terms of net zero embodied carbon, they're not particularly well aligned. So the certifications give you a good, really broad picture of a sustainability approach, um, but actually they're not kind of set up specifically to drive net zero embodied carbon in structures on projects. Um, so that's the voluntary cert certifications brought about the mandatory construction legislation. Um, so there's there's quite a few bits of legislation coming in internationally, particularly in Europe. Uh, One Click LCA have done the study recently looking at um, different bits of legislation and trying to map those as well in terms of their openness, the policies, and also the impact they're likely to have on decarbonisation. And we can see that actually some, some uh, areas are really ahead of the game. Um, the upcoming Net Zero Carbon's building standard isn't mapped on here, but it'll probably be in the similar sort of leaders field, I think. Um, but really Denmark, the uh, UK, London plan, um, and Part Z if that ever gets um, put into uh, legislation in the UK. And Finland are kind of really ahead of the game in terms of maximizing decarbonization impacts, but also making it as open as possible. So perhaps there's some stuff that we can learn from looking at these different policies cross borders and seeing how we can uh, align things between different countries. And certainly from a wider point of view, uh, you've got uh, things like new EU directives coming in, which will also set a kind of baseline of um, carbon emissions and decarbonization, but it's going to be a bit further down the line. So we're seeing a kind of trend here of, of things starting very small, maybe just like, you know, London or just one particular country. And then over time, then that sort of um, legislation then gets rolled out more widely and has more of an impact and a more broad perspective. Um, but when you actually try and map all these together, as if let's say you've got um, a piece of legislation or a methodology to assess carbon in your buildings uh, in the UK, and you want to compare that to, uh, say, buildings in Finland, and you want to see, okay, what can we learn from uh, the, the guys in Finland about how we can um, improve our construction practice? Maybe they're doing something really well that we're not. Actually, it's very difficult to actually compare them like for like because um, this, this piece of research we've done here actually shows that the scope of all the different assessments, the methodologies, the way you're actually measuring carbon varies very differently, um, varies very widely. So there's no kind of like clear one standard way of um, doing it, which would allow you to definitively say, this country's doing something better, we should pick up on their best practice. So there's a few challenges there about actually looking at it more broadly. Okay, and then finally, I'm just going to run through how we actually go about hitting these targets internationally. Um, so Jonathan Russell and I did a piece of work recently as part of the sustainability panel, um, and all credit to John for mapping out this legislation onto structural engineering. But we looked at basically the different carbon targets that are in legislation at the moment, voluntary schemes, mandatory schemes, and how they actually map when you just look at the structural engineering bits, the bits that us as structural engineers have impacts over. Um, and we can see that actually uh, they're all kind of on the right trends towards, I guess, net zero by 2050. Um, and you can actually map that against the scores pathway as well. So this is the I-Struct-T um, carbon rating system. Um, and you'll see that actually if you follow the scores trajectory, which is the, the curve line down the middle, then you're probably on the right side of most bits of upcoming legislation. So it's a good kind of like benchmark of what, you know, where, where we should be. Um, of course, as uh, people that have joined the ISTRACT's Climate Emergency e Conference, you're probably also already quite informed on this and you're already pushing pushing the envelope a bit. So really, we should be aiming to be on the kind of the lower end of that. So maybe 40% better than the ISTRACT scores pathway to account for the fact that not everyone is going to be as forward thinking as I'm sure you are. Um, in general, though, if we try and align with the scores pathway, then we're going to be beating most current targets. Um, so that's C or better in 2023 for all your buildings. Um, but is that actually going to be enough? Um, and this is another piece of work that we've done looking at basically mapping the national climate commitments and carbon budgets that have been set to the legislation that um, is currently in place in Denmark, specifically here. Um, and you can see that the, the legislation has set kind of carbon budgets and carbon targets up at the sort of 300, and obviously it's reducing over time. Um, and the voluntary, legis uh, the voluntary scheme is a bit lower down as well. But depending on exactly how you allocate, the, the budgets, the carbon budgets, um, 
it kind of suggests that actually we're we're some way off actually um, getting it as low as we really need it to be. And this this sort of assumes there's a lot of assumptions in there about us continuing with our current rate of construction. Um, but there's there's a bit of a gap here. So there's a gap between what we're required to do by legislation and what we can actually um, what what we actually need to do to hit national climate commitments and hopefully align with the 1.5 degree C pathway. So how do we actually go about closing this gap? And I, I'd like to close by just saying that the, I think the uh, one way of doing this potentially is demand reduction. So we just build fewer new buildings and go for a refurbished first approach. And we're hearing this a lot um, in work by the UK GBC and other um, public sector um, policies as well. Um, but yeah, demand reduction is definitely one way of doing that. Um, but if we are going down the kind of demand reduction route, um, effectively just building less, then think about it more broadly in an international perspective. How do we prioritize what actually gets built? There's this idea of a just transition to make sure that um, we're kind of realizing the best value um, of our limited carbon budget across different bits of the world and aligning with the UN sustainable development goals. Um, so the value of infrastructure in developing nations versus the value of a kind of ultra modern but super sustainable building in the developed world really needs to be considered. Um, and currently that's not really being done across, across a kind of global perspective. So just, just to finish then, we've got effectively a, a finite carbon budget and we need to work out the best way of spending that. We've got um, economic benefits of construction, but actually arguably the G7 and the kind of developed nations which are setting these carbon targets have already seen a lot of the benefits of construction. And really, if we want to maximize the social benefit, then arguably a lot of new construction would need to happen in the developing world. So that was a very quick run through covering quite a few different policy topics. I hope we have kept this time. I think we're running a little bit behind, but, um, but that should give you a good picture of where net zero sits in the broader sustainability perspective. Uh, what's driving on our projects, and then also our role as designers and also stewards of good sustainable practice in policy making, supporting our clients. Thank you very much.